Okay, thank you, everybody. David G., Alcoholic Addict. Really grateful to be here with you guys tonight. Grateful to have a week off and to be able to come back to this. Had a really good time with family, and uh, I hope you guys did as well. So it's been really good to uh, have a little time off and then come back and finish up this chapter and finish out the book study uh, within the next few weeks, most likely. So really, really grateful. And um, uh, as always, I want to first off thank a loving God as, as I've understood him today. I want to thank Ashley for her service and Dennis, as always. You guys are just amazing with all of this. And thank you so much for all these weeks, all of you coming out. You can always tell who are the diehard in any fellowship because they're the ones that stay the end no matter what. We started out what we had about 50, 60 people consistently all the way through this, you know, and then all the way through those chapters. But you start getting into the back chapters and it starts to fade away just a little bit. Maybe it's not as exciting. I don't know. I, I think once you've had the awakening without these chapters here, is you really lose out on so much. I offer this to anybody I take through the 12 steps. I always offer them to go through these back chapters one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I've had a few do that. Most don't. They want to go on and, and do whatever they do, and that's okay, too. But there's a lot of good information back here, as we've already seen. One of my grand sponsors used to tell the story of, uh, of Mad Dog. He'd say, you have people that go into the bar, and they just kind of belly up to the bar, and they have a few drinks, and they tell stories, and they kind of cry in their beer, and for them, that's as much as there is. But then you've got people that come into the bar and they have a few drinks and they want to get up and they want to dance and they want to fight and they want to do some things. They want to be out in the street hollering because they know there's more and we need more and more and more. So when I think of diehards and Alcoholics Anonymous or any fellowship, I think of people like you guys that are here week after week after week all the way to the end of it, no matter what. So this is a really good chapter that we're in tonight. We're going to be studying a vision for you on page 151. In the big book, chapter 11, I was told early on that a dream is something that can be interpreted. But a vision is something that someone must have the ability to see beyond the physical, kind of the metaphysical beyond. And so we will see how that vision has played out. And we will also see how self has come in and stole this vision from some of these people, just as it has a lot of us. And so we just want to look carefully at the book and how to proceed once we've had this spiritual awakening, because really this is what we're headed for. The vision for us is that we will help others. We will remain close to our creator and, uh, you know, a good life follows. So with all that being said, we're going to kick off on page 151 tonight. And it says this, for most normal folks and i don't even really know what that is i'm not so sure that we're not the normal one because i don't really think there's anything abnormal about letting a power greater than yourself run your life i just don't so i'm not so sure that we're not the normal ones here drinking or whatever it is you may suffer from conviviality companionship and colorful imagination that's what drinking or whatever it is brings on it means release from care boredom and worry it is joyous intimacy with friends and a feeling. That's the key word for that we've been watching for all the way through this book, all the way through. It's a feeling that life is good. But in reality, we know better than that. We know, and it's about to show us here what happens when such feelings come in and begin to dominate us. But not so with us in those last days of heavy drinking. The old pleasures were gone. That's a promise in this book. They were but memories. That's a promise in this book. And here's another one. Never could we recapture the great moments of the past. And it's kind of strange that self sets that up to where I always fall back on memories and I'm always chasing after something that I'm never going to be able to get a hold of. I'm either in the past or I'm in the future. I'm far from the now. And it was that way for most of my life. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been in the fellowship, sober in the fellowship for close to 29 years now. And it has only been over the last couple of years that I've really been able to stay closer to the now than ever before. So never could we recapture the great moments of the past. 
there was an insistent yearning. Look at how self yearns for that. It just does. And all this time I'm thinking this is me. I'm doing all of this, but I'm being directed by a different system of thought, which is called self. And this is how it looks. You know, I mean, when I read this book now, I mean, it's very clear to me. I couldn't see this for many years. There was an insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did and a heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do it. There was always one more attempt, one more failure. Why? There was no God. There was no creator, no source, whatever you want to call it. This is nothing but self. So the less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself. I found myself in that very same position at 25 years of being sober and not drinking due to the lust addiction that I was suffering from. Well, self, but it manifested as lust addiction at the time. I found myself doing this inside of the fellowship, and that's a very dangerous place to be for anybody that is so newly sober, old sober, whatever. So as we became subjects of King Alcohol, shivering denizens in his mad realm, I want to look what's behind all of that. What is it that's behind any of that? And as we've seen all the way through this book for 39 or 40 weeks, however long it's been now, we see that that is self, and this is how it manifests. This is what it does. That chilling vapor, that loneliness has settled down. It thickened, ever becoming blacker. Some of us sought out sordid places. Now I'm beginning to take action on my misery. I'm beginning to run from this thing. But it doesn't matter where I run. I'm always there. <laughs> and it's what I find over and over. Hoping to find understanding, companionship, and approval. Hoping. You know, that's kind of that dream world, you know, that we talked about. A dream is something that can be interpreted. So this is what I'm looking for. But anytime I find that, that's not enough. I need more and more and more. It's never going to be enough because self is never going to allow it to be. It says, momentarily we did, then would come oblivion and the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Now, there's a lot of people that's on this meeting tonight that have been in the fellowship for a long time. And some of us have taken a pretty severe beating inside of the fellowship. And we have faced these hideous four horsemen, even sober. This doesn't only mean when we're drunk. In 2019, I found myself faced with this awful awakening to face those hideous four horsemen. And it was one of the worst times in my life that I could remember. And I hadn't had a drink or a drug inside of me for a very long time. But I had drifted so far away from the power of God. That self had just really begun to have its way with me with lust. So let's look at the word terror. We know that comes from fear, bewilderment. We know that comes from selfish and self-seeking. Frustration, we know that comes from resentment. Despair, we know that comes from dishonesty. We're in desperation. We're running from this thing. And our book has showed us over and over and over. These are the four main things in how self manifests. So it's no different here. Whenever I begin to awaken, I'm going to have to face these. And my problem was I could just never face them. I always had to run back to whatever medication I was taking at the time, whether it be alcohol, drugs, lust, food, whatever it may be. So the book says unhappy drinkers are unhappy sober members that, that have drifted away from this. Who read this page will understand. Now and then a serious drinker being dry at the time, not sober dry at the moment he says i don't miss it at all feel better work better having a better time and i think there's a lot of times that i would do that even though i knew deep in my heart that that something was was very wrong and that's what they say here on 152 we can smile as such a sally because we know our friend is like a boy whistling in the dark to keep up his spirits i mean if that is not the bondage of self i don't know what is I mean, that is a very vivid picture of it. He fools himself. See, I don't think it's me that fools me. I think it's self that fools me into believing it's me. But our book says he fools himself inwardly, see. He would give anything to take a half a dozen drinks and get away with it or be on the Internet or whatever it is that, that we do. He will presently try the old game again. Why? Because the obsession will always win out. Always. 
I can't overcome that without the power of God. There is just no way. And my problem is I will turn to God and I will pray to God and I'll think, God, please help me. Please help me. But all of this time I'm praying to the God of reason and I don't even know this is what's going on with me. I don't because I'm trying to reason out a solution within my mind. What would God have me do this, this? None of that is coming from God. Once I connect to this power, I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is be, be present, be still, just be. But um, here, you know, if I'm trying to do something, then that should always be my first clue that self has returned and is manifested through me. It says he isn't happy about his sobriety. No, of course not. He cannot picture life without alcohol or whatever it may be. Look at the word picture. He cannot picture. I cannot vision. Why? Because I cannot see. I can't see because I'm blinded by self. So someday he will be able to, key word right here, imagine life with either alcohol, lust, drugs, sex, whatever it is, or without it. I can't imagine any of that because I can't see. I'm blinded. Then he will know loneliness, such as few do. He will be at the jumping off place. He will wish for the end. Now, Bill Wilson described this in his story. And to get a little better look at this in a bird's eye view of what Bill was talking about, let's hold our place right there. And let's just kind of journey backwards in the book a little bit over to page 16. If you have your book and you want to flip there with me, let's go back over to page 16 and let's look at what happened to Bill. And to Bill's friend. First full paragraph, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with them are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. Could you imagine? In his home. He could not or would not see our way alive. And that's exactly what happens to us back over here. When we leave, leave this untreated, we don't come in all the way in and sit all the way down, get a sponsor, go through this process of the work, begin to heal emotionally because I can get sober and not drink by going to meetings and doing those things. I can stay away from the alcohol. But the problem is I don't ever recover emotionally. And I don't even really know this is going on. Why would it be after 25 years of sobriety and working the steps as many times as I did, I still would feel like I was a piece of crap because I was taking actions that was unfitting. It was inappropriate, you know, to God and to man. Why am I living a life where there's shame and I'm having to hide and do all of this stuff? Well, it's because I'm holding these secrets within and there is something directing my thinking and I'm taking action based on those thoughts and I've created a reality of hell and I don't know how to get out of it. I don't know how to get out of it at all. And I'm looking right here in this book, and it says he will know loneliness such as few do. <laughs> I guarantee you, so most of us can relate to this. He will wish for the end. And that's a wish. That's kind of like a prayer almost. So he says, we have shown you how we got out from under. Remember in the first seven chapters, this is exactly what they showed us how to do. They showed us how to get out from under the bondage of self, not drinking, not lust, not sex, all that. By the time you get to chapter seven or chapter three or whatever, this book and this work is assuming that you've been sober for a little while by this time. So we're not trying to show you how to get sober. We're trying to show you how to keep from going back to that, which drives you to drink, lust, act out, eat, whatever it is. So this book definitely shows us that's a great promise. We have shown how we got out from under. You say, yes, I'm willing. This is kind of strange. Look at this sentence close. Man, I'm willing. Dennis, I'm willing. But have I really got to be consigned to a life where I shall be stupid, born, and glum? See how the spirit jumped in for just a second there. I'm willing. Look at the very next sentence. Self overrides that. Remember, it talks about that back over and more about alcoholism. It will run parallel with our same thing. And, you know, the insane idea will win out. And that's what happens here. Am I to be consigned to a life where I shall be stupid, born, and glum like some righteous people I see? See judgment there? That's judgment. I know I must get along without liquor or whatever it may be, but how can I have you a sufficient substitute? 
Yes, there is a substitute, and it's vastly more than that. It is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, we're talking about something very different from the program as outlined in the book in this particular paragraph. He says there, talking about the fellowship, you will find release from care, boredom, and worry. Your imagination will be fired for a short time. For a short time, it will be. I promise. It's, I mean, we connect with people that are like us. We begin to share. They love on us. We love on them. We begin to open up, and it seems like a very beautiful experience, and we're all going to meetings, and we're having a good time, and things are going well. And one day, I start feeling a little empty in here. I don't really know why, and I can't explain it. I don't know. You know, maybe we ought to hang out after the meeting for a little bit. We hang out, we go to coffee, and most of them leave, but I hang around, and then, I, you know, I start seeking out other things. You know, as we become sober and we begin to try to recover, other things begin to compete for our recovery and sobriety. And the bad news is those things usually went out. When we're not ready for that, I'm just going to meetings. I'm not really working the program. Nobody has showed me how to work 10 and 11 on a daily basis. Nobody has showed me that self is what set me up for the fall over and over and over. Hell, I'm going to fall. There's no doubt I'm going to fall. So it says your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. Look at all them promises. The most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. Thus, we find the fellowship, and so will you. How is that to come about, you asked? Where am I to find these people? Well, you're going to meet these new friends in your own community. Near you, alcoholics are dying helplessly like people in a sinking ship. And if you think about that and you watch our fellowships and the people that come in and go out and come in and go out and those that go out and never get to come back. We see it over and over and over. It, it talked about this a little more in depth. Back over in, there is a solution there. It, it talked about it. So if you live in a large place, there are hundreds, high and low, rich and poor. These are future fellows of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the illness, as I understand it, doesn't really care whether you're rich or poor, you're black, you're white, you're tall, little, skinny. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. There are no favorites here. I promise, or I haven't ever seen any. Among them, you will make lifelong friends. I've made a lot of lifelong friends in Alcoholics Anonymous and the other fellowships that I'm connected to today. You will be bound to them with new and wonderful ties. You will escape disaster together. What a beautiful promise right there. But I tell you, I've got to be able to trust these people with all of my heart, <laughs> able for me to even be willing to try to take that step to, to begin to escape disaster because it's been my experience that some people I was trying to escape with self come back in, overtook our relationship and hell, we both went down even the, the drain even further. So, you know, I need to be careful about the people that I choose. And Emmett Fox said, be careful of the God you choose because that's the one you get here. And, you know, if you believe in, in something, Hellfire and brimstone and get ready because that's probably the way it's going to be. So you will commence shoulder to shoulder your common journey. I have a lot of people call me up that time and they'll say, David, will you sponsor me? I just tell them, man, I don't really like that word. It's, it's more of a term than anything else here. I like the word shoulder to shoulder. Let's walk shoulder to shoulder our common journey through this deal together. I have a lot of people sometimes that will call me up and they already have sponsors and I just tell them, don't worry about it, man. If you're looking for a new experience, let's go through this work. Let's walk shoulder to shoulder. So then you'll know what it means to give of yourself that others may survive and rediscover life. I guarantee that's all spirit. That was something I would have never done ever, ever, ever. You will learn the full meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. It took me many years to learn the full meaning of that. I had a pretty good concept of it, but today I have a full meaning of that because I do love my neighbor. I want to see people recover. So it may seem incredible, but these men are to become happy, respected, and useful once more. Beautiful promises there. How can they rise out of such misery, bad recruit, and hopelessness? And there's a question mark there. And if you remember back on page 64, let's take a trip over there just for a second. This is talking about our third step decision that we took. 
And it says, which many of us have never attempted, though our decision, step three, was a vital and crucial step. It would have little or permanent effect, and that's the promise. Unless at once, not after a while or in a few days or after my sponsor gives me the green light to go, no, at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of those things. And here's the key words, in ourselves, which has been blocking us. See, those things are within me. That's what blocks me. My problem is I believe it's everything on the outside of me. Once all that gets straightened out, once these people straighten up, once they do this, 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 I'll be okay. No, it's not out there. It's in here. And so it's the same thing here on 153. How can they rise out of such misery, bad repute, and helplessness? And 64 there kind of gives us a bird's eye view of what that answer is going to be. It says our liquor was but a symptom. That's what I use to medicate these emotions. Same way with lust or whatever it is I'm suffering from. So we have to get down to causes and conditions. So if liquor, drugs, sex, food, whatever it may be, did not cause my condition, then what the hell did? And that's what the rest of the book is going to lay out all the way up to chapter 7. And it's already given us a bird's eye view from step two all the way over here. Even in one, if you pick it apart real close and look, we begin to see that ideas, emotions, concepts, beliefs, attitudes, all of these things inside of us is what has been blocking us. And Carl Jung, when he had his conversation with Roland Hazard, there on page 27, and I know we've referred to this a lot of times in the middle of the page, he was trying to explain the spiritual experience to Roland. And he said it like this. He said, to me, these occurrences, these spiritual experiences are phenomenal. They appear to be in the nature of a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. See, that's what we've got to have in order to recover. You want to get sober, just don't drink. You want to Quit acting. You know, you want to quit less than acting. Just don't act out no more. You should be, if that's the problem, you should be okay. But every time we quit doing that, then another problem shows up within the mind. It's pissed off and it's mad and it's sad and it's depressed. And it's all of these things. But look what he says, ideas, emotions, and attitudes. That's what self is, which were once the guiding force of the lives of these men. And if you turn that word guiding forces around, that would say forces guiding, and that's what's going on inside of my head. There is forces guiding me through my ideas, emotions, and attitudes. But he says these things are suddenly cast to one side, and a new set of conceptions and motives come in and begin to dominate them. So that's, you know, when we go through this process, that's what we have in mind to recover from are those things there. Because once we recover from that, None of this other stuff is going to exist anyway. And people say, well, David, how do you know that's not true? You know, I, I know a lot of people that have had this and they didn't recover. Not according to my book. Page 85 says it like this. We have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Not from lust, not from alcohol, not from drugs, not from any of that. From the shit that drives us to all that stuff. That's what I've been placed in. I didn't place myself there. I was placed there as a result of going through this process and doing exactly what it said for me to do. That's how I recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. I didn't recover from alcohol. I didn't recover from lust and drugs and sex. That no longer exists because my mind is no longer there. It's somewhere else. It's with spirit now. It's not there. It's not in the lower system of thought. So that's how these men can rise out of such misery, bad repute, and hopelessness. And here it is. The practical answer is, since these things have happened among us, they can happen with you. But there is a condition here. And this is it. Should you wish them above all else? Remember, it says, if you want what we have to offer. And I don't think that's talking about all of this. I mean, love and all this stuff, that's all a big part of it. Don't get me wrong. But I think we're talking about this spiritual experience, this awakening from self. Should you wish that above all else? And there's more. Be willing to make use of our experience. So the first thing is I'm going to need to wish that above all else. I need a vision for that. 
And next, I need to be willing to take some action to make use of this experience. And our book says we are sure this will come. And it has been my experience and the experience of many people on here that are now sponsoring people through this process. It feels the very same way. The age of miracles is still with us. Our own recovery proves that. And that's absolutely the truth. So our hope is that when this chip of a book is launched onto the world tide of alcoholism, you're not just alcohol, not just lust, not just ism. I, people say that's I, self, and me. I sponsor me. I see that as self, a set of beliefs and concepts and ideas. Remember, Roland, talking with the doctor, explained the same thing. So when this chip of a book is launched on the world tide, look at that, a world tide, we got some surfers on here. They know about a tide. They know about a good tide, you know, a good wave for sure. And so it's like we're going to launch the book on all you surfers here that suffer from alcoholism. And <laughs> no, it's uh, but it, it says defeated drinker will seize upon it. And here's why to follow its suggestions and see, that's just something I was never really willing to do completely. Reason being is I already felt like I had followed suggestions the way I was supposed to. I was 25 years sober at that time, for God's sake. But why was my life in ruins and hell even after that many years? So when I look at the fifth tradition in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, it says our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. I always thought that was for the newcomer. But there's a hell of a lot of old timers sitting in our program that are suffering from alcoholism and that are dying inside of the rooms because we're too ashamed or embarrassed to step up and say, we need help and need a new experience for something we already felt like we have self will hide that from us and it will end up killing us inside of the rooms. I've seen it over and over and over, but if we'll take and follow its suggestions, like it's saying here on page 153, look at the promise. Many, we are sure will rise to their feet and march on, man, what a beautiful promise. Do you remember that back on page 19? Let's take a quick trip over there and take a look at this. It told us this way early in the book. I mean, this is nothing new. He's just kind of going back over it again and again. Let's look at the bottom of page 18. He says no lectures to be endured. They're out there on that very last sentence, you know, no lectures to be endured. He said, these are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, Many take up their beds and walk again. And what a beautiful promise. And so back over here on 153, we see it again. If we will seize up on it, if we will follow the suggestions, many, we are sure, will rise to their feet and march on. They will approach still other sick ones. That's exactly what we do. Uh, you remember uh, in Bill's story, he talked about that was one of the conditions that Abby had for him. And uh, that's one of the conditions I have whenever I take somebody through this work. It's, uh, I mean, there's just no way around that. So page 13 at the bottom, he says, my friend promised when these things were done, I'd enter up on a new relationship with my creator. I'd have the elements of a way of living, which answered all my problems. And so I think once that we're freed of this, it's not something I have to wonder, you know, am I going to help this one or that one? I mean, it just it just comes. So they will approach still other sick ones, and fellowships of Alcoholics Anonymous may spring up in each city and hamlet havens for those who must find a way out. Well, the good news is we have a way out. Remember page 17 in this book, and we'll take a quick trip there right quick. Last paragraph, after he's already told us, you know, the fellowship's a good thing, but if you rely on it solely, it's going to kill you. That's what he meant by three or four sentences up from that last paragraph when he said the feeling of having shared in a common peril is only one element. He's talking about the fellowship that's only one element. That's not the whole picture. But look at this warning. That in itself would never have held us together as we're now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is we have discovered a common solution. And here it is, what 153 was talking about. We have a way out. <laughs> By God, I'm interested. And I promise you at that time, even at 25 years after as much as I thought I knew about this book, I was still most definitely interested at that time. We can join in brotherly and harmonious action. See, that's the great news, this book. 
not this fellowship. And I got to have this fellowship. I'm not talking crap about it. I'm not. But it says that's the great news. This book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. So 153. In the chapter, Working with Others, Chapter 7, and we went through that just a little while back, you gathered an idea, and that's kind of where everything starts from, whether it's good or bad, it starts from that idea of how we approach and aid others to health. Suppose now that through you, several families have adopted this way of life. You'll want to know more of how to proceed from that point. Perhaps the best way of treating you to a glimpse of your future, not theirs, yours, ours, will be to describe the growth of the fellowship among us. Here's a brief account, and we're going to take a bird's eye view look of Bill Wilson here. Years ago in 1935, one of our number made a journey to a certain western city. So we know that that's Bill who went to Akron, Ohio. Now, from a business standpoint, his trip come off badly. That's how he saw it. That was his dream was to go to Akron, make money, get out of this financial pinch he was in. I mean, he had a dream. But he went there, and he ended up with God's vision, and thank God for that. It said from a business standpoint, his trip came off badly. Had he been successful in his enterprise, He would have been set on his feet financially, which at the time seemed, keyword, vitally important. But his venture wound up in a lawsuit and bogged down completely. The proceeding was shot through with much hard feeling. Anytime that something like that's pulled out from under me, I'm definitely going to have some hard feelings. But I've come to learn that these hard feelings aren't coming from me. They're coming from resentment, which is a common manifestation of self. We learned that back on page 64. So, bitterly discouraged, he found himself in a strange place. I wonder how he done that. Well, if I look at the preceding words above, we need to see first that this was set up by the mind. He had an expectation that he was going to go to the city. He was going to make a lot of money. He and Lois would be on his feet. He would have been set on his feet financially. And that seemed vitally important. But once that didn't play out, my sponsor told me this many years ago. He said, David, go ahead and make the plan all you want. Just don't plan the outcome of that plan. And it's taken me a lot of years to really learn how to do that. Because the outcome of that plan may not be what God had in mind. And I think this is what, you know, this is what comes to mind as I read this here. He planned the plan, and he already had the outcome of the plan planned out, but that didn't come through the way. So now he's bitterly discouraged. When I'm bitterly discouraged, what do I do? Well, I find myself in some strange places, too. How about some of you guys? (laughs) I don't know about you, but I know about me, and this is exactly what happens to me. He says discredited and almost broke, so he had a little bit of money anyway. He was still physically weak and sober, but a few months. I think he was sober for six months at this time. He saw, there's that vision. His predicament was dangerous. There was a day that I couldn't see that even when I was right in the middle of it. But thank God, you know, enough sanity was there that he's seen this. He wanted so much to talk with someone, but whom? One dismal afternoon, he paced the hotel lobby, wondering how his bill was to be paid. At the end of the room stood a glass-covered directory of local churches, and down the lobby, a door opened to an attractive bar. That's where my mind would have went, too, I guarantee you. He could see the gay crowd inside, and in there, he would find companionship and release. This is the mind that's telling him all of this stuff. It's no different with what it's doing to him here. So unless he took some drinks, he might not have the courage to scrape up an acquaintance and would have a lonely weekend. Kind of makes you wonder what he might have been looking for there. A little more than booze, I would think, if you're a guy like most of us. So anyway, this is what's going on in the mind. Well, let's see how sanity overrides insanity this time, and thank God that it did. Of course he couldn't drink, you know, and I mean, that's kind of what self tells me. Of course you can't drink. Of course you can't 
you know, you can't play around the way that you used to, but we can go down there and check it out anyway. I mean, you know, and, and this is all going on in the mind. So it says, of course, he couldn't drink, but why not set hopeful at a table, a bottle of ginger ale before him? I could just see it now, a beautiful crowd, lots of beautiful women, music, soft lights, low. And I'm sitting here with a glass of ginger ale. Yeah, right. Ain't going to last very long at all. But thank God what happened, because what happened to him here, God's plan come full circle. And it, man, so it has been ever since. Fear gripped him. I guarantee you. Anytime that all those kind of thoughts are going on, and I'm about to take action based on that. And fear grips me. That's not always a bad thing. But it says he was on thin ice. And again, it was the old insidious insanity, the first drink. With a shiver, he turned away and walked down the lobby. There's no way he could have done this without spirit. There's just no way. To the church directory, music and a gay chatter still floated to him from the bar. Look how sanity appears. Boom. Just like, I mean, sanity comes quick. When it comes, sometimes it takes a long time to come, but when it comes, it comes quick. And it came quick here. Look at how he thinks, starts thinking. But what about his responsibility, his family, and the men who would die because they did not know how to get well? I guarantee you, I went through this in my lust addiction. There have been times when I've thought, man, this would be a great idea if I'd done this, if I'd done this with this and this. And it's a wonderful idea. And I know it in my mind. It's a great idea. But I guarantee you what happened to him, thank God, has always happened to me. It comes back and it says, what about the day whenever those women come back and need help? What you going to do then? You're going to be standing up here talking to everybody about how you've recovered from lust addiction and how you've been invited to all these towns to speak on it. And you've been up in the middle of it. Where do thoughts like that come from when I'm in the midst of making a plan? You know, it's like, ah. so anyway, sanity returns. Thank God. Thank God. What about his responsibilities? His family, the men who would die because they did not know how to get well. Oh, yes. Those other alcoholics. See, he's no longer thinking about self. Now he's thinking about others. There must be many such in this town. Of course there would be. He'd phone a clergyman. Look at here. His sanity returned. So if it returned, it must have been insanity that he was suffering from. And we know that that is a manifestation of self. His sanity returned. How often do we do this? We have a bad thought. We're about to go out the door. We get a good thought. We get to hang on another day. Sometimes I'll wait till the end of the day and thank God. But a lot of times I would not thank God in that moment. But he did. His sanity returned and he thanked God right then. Selecting the church at random from the directory, he stepped into the booth and lifted a receiver. He was definitely getting ready to step into the bar and pick up a glass of booze. There was no doubt that's where he was headed. So he's called to the clergyman, led him presently to a certain resident of the town. This is going to be Dr. Bob. This is how we're going to start seeing him appear to the picture now. Who, though formerly able and respected, was then nearing the nadir of alcoholic despair. It was the usual situation, home in jeopardy, wife field, children distracted. Anybody else went through any of this in their addiction? Bills in the arrears and standing damaged, he had a desperate desire to stop. And I see this a lot with people in our fellowship. A lot of people have a desperate desire to stop, but they just don't know how. Because you go in and you'll hear all this crap, you know, just don't drink, go to meetings. Well, hell, if I could just not drink, I don't need to go to meetings. If I could just not drink, I just can't not drink. I can't not lust. I don't have that kind of power. I'm without it. And so anytime that we see that word, those words, a desperate desire, really that's what we're looking for. Because I, if I remember right, it talked about that toward the end of um, There is a Solution. Page 28, if you just want to take a quick second to make a run back over there. Second paragraph. We, in our turn, sought the same escape with the desperation of drowning men. 
And what seemed at first seemed to friends you read is now proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life's been given us, or if you prefer a design for living that really works. So anymore, I've sponsored a lot of people in 29 years. Anymore, unless that person is utterly hopeless and helpless and willing to do anything it takes, what whatever it may be. And I really, I try to get them the help they need through somebody else, but I really don't want to sponsor anybody. That's not completely 100% in desperation. It's just, I've not had much luck with that at all. So, but Bob did. He had a desperate desire to stop. He saw no way out. His vision was aimed in the wrong direction, wasn't it? For he'd earnestly tried many avenues of escape. You have to remember, he was a member of the Oxford He had been to many of those meetings. He had done all of that stuff to no avail. He always drank again, but he never really knew the problem. The book tells us this in the front. It says, painfully aware of being somehow abnormal, the man did not fully realize what it meant to be an alcoholic. And if you look at the asterisk there at the bottom, it says, this refers to Bill's first visit with Dr. Bob. These men later become co-founders of AA. Bill's story opens up the text of the book, and Dr. Bob's heads the story section. And my ego used to say, well, ah, yeah, that to Bill Wilson, you know, he was so egotistical. He had to be in the front of the book. And someone stopped me at a meeting one night, and they said, do you even know why it's that way? Well, here you run your head about it quite a bit, but do you even know why? And I said, no. They said, read Dr. Bob's nightmare. He suffered for four years with the obsession after he quit drinking to drink. Bill came in, worked the steps, had a miraculous spiritual experience and recovery. Who in the hell story would you want in the front of the book if you had the choice? I'm like, wow. <laughs> I never looked at it like, no, of course you didn't. And so, you know, I've changed my mind about a lot of it. But I like what it said, painfully aware, painfully aware. Boy, that awareness is painful sometimes. Being somehow abnormal that the man did not fully realize what it meant to be alcoholic. So we'll chew on that for this week. And, uh, Sure, glad you guys came out. Hope to see you again next week as we move on and continue moving through this chapter to finish it off. So thanks so much for letting me share. This concludes David's share on tonight's chapter, but we encourage you to keep listening as he answers questions from the audience and shares additional experience, strength, and hope. Hey, David. Man, thank you. I'm so glad... I love this chapter. I love how you're just opening it up. You and I went through this before, and it's just opened up more and more. One of the things I thought a lot about, there's this thing on page 152 where it says, Am I consigned to be a lot, to a life where I shall be stupid, boring, and glum? Uh, what in the world do I think my life was? I, I was stupid, boring, and glum. I might have been entertaining, but that's not the same as, as as what they're talking about here. So that's great. Yes, I am going to be unconsigned from that life. I appreciate that so much. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I do want to bring this up again, and if this isn't the time to do it, we'll leave it sit for now. But you just mentioned at the end of your share there that when you're working with a new person, you're looking for a person who is truly desperate. Willing to go to, really willing to go to any lengths to get it. And my experience is when I talk to people, they all say, oh, yeah, I'm willing, I'm desperate, I'm willing. And I just sometimes feel like it turns out that what they're saying is, I'll say whatever you need me to say so that I can have a sponsor, which is not the same thing as going through the work. So I know one of the things that you mentioned is just, Get them going on 10 and 11. If that isn't happening, say, hey, looks like you're you're blowing smoke. But uh, any other ideas that you have as far as even before getting that far where you can differentiate the truth from the false, so to speak, in that situation would be appreciated? Thanks. Yeah, good to see you, Jason, always. man. Good to see all you guys. You know, whenever I take anyone through this process of the work, and, and you know this, all of you guys that have been with me here for a long time know this, We always do what is called the interview process off of page 90 of this book. And whenever I look at that, and you know this, I mean, we've talked about this many times. As I'm looking at these questions down through here, when you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about him. 
One thing I'm going to do is ask him a series of questions. Where are you from? Is that where you've always lived? Where do you work? What do you do? How many jobs have you had? Have you lost? What all things do you suffer from? Are you married? Are you not? You got any children? I mean, I uh, find out all I can about him. I want to hear about his story. I want to hear about what's happened to you since you've come into the rooms and tried to get sober and you've not been able to tell me what goes on in your mind prior to relapse. And right there, that very next question on page 90 comes into play here. If he doesn't want to stop drinking, don't waste time because you're going to be able to find out pretty quick. I was in a park one time and I called a guy up and I said, I need help. He said, okay. He said, you willing to go to any lengths to recover? And I said, absolutely. He said, you desperate, completely desperate. I said, I am. He said, drop on your knees right now. We're going to do the third step press. And I went, man, there's people all around out here. He said, no, go ahead. Get on your knees and let's say the third step prayer together. And I hung a a little more. He said, man, don't even waste my time. And he clicked the phone and he hung up and never <laughs> talked to that dude again, even to this day. So if I want to find out if someone is willing to go to any links, there's a lot of different things I can do. That's just one. But, you know, as we read on down through that, usually, and as you get down toward the end of that paragraph, it says you need this information to put yourself in his place to see how you would like to, for him to approach you if the tables were turned. The whole time that he's telling me all this stuff, he's telling me how to sponsor him. He is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know, they mainly because of my experience, whether he's willing to go to any lengths to do this or not. I picked up somebody here just uh, the other day, and I can already see that that's not, it's not working out because, you know, 10, I, I had a little talk with him about 10 because this is something that we always do. We start watching those thoughts and emotions from day. You guys know all this. And, you know, and then it come flooding in and all of a sudden it just went blank. And, I, you know, I'm watching this and watching this and watching this. And then, you know, the person gets hold of me and says, hey, you mind if I skip on the nightly review tonight? You know, I've got a pretty bad headache. And it's like, okay. Do you ever have too much of a headache not to drink, not to lust, not to act out, not to eat, any of that? How, how did the headache keep you from that? But for me, I don't, you know, I'm not saying any of those things. I just know that that desperateness is not there. And, you know, there's no point in wasting time like the book says. So that's just a few things that I've experienced along the way. A few of many, but, but a few anyway. So thanks, Jason. Good to see you, brother. Thank you, David. You too. Um, I love that here he is. He's uh, filling the uh, life on life's terms. And his answer is to go have a drink. And what I love about it. He was a six months sober, and had he went and took that drink, he may never have came back. This book would never may have been written, and we wouldn't have this program. And one of the things that David talked about in the share here is that if he's going to bring somebody on, that also they have a willingness to work with others. And at the very end of that page, on page 154, it said, Ah, oh, yes, those other alcoholics, there must be many in this town. He would phone a clergyman. He turned his thoughts in that moment. And it says, remember in our 10th step, where if we turn our thoughts, we don't have to take the action. He took the action. But immediately when he turned his thoughts to phone that clergyman and to help another, because he knew he was in trouble, his sanity returned and he thanked God. There's another place back on page 15 where Bill, as he was getting sober and getting into this program, in the middle of that first full paragraph, it said that I was not too well at the time, and this is sober. I was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink, but I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Many times I've gone to my old hospital in despair. Once talking to a man there, and here it is, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It is a design for living that works in rough going. And that's my experience as well. If I'm struggling, which there are going to be times I do, if I'll go work with another sexaholic, I will be amazingly lifted up on my feet. And that's why it's such an important part of this program is working with others because without it, there's going to be certain trials and low spots, like it says back on the bottom of 14. They're going to hit me. And if I'm not uh, in, enlarging my spiritual program, 
I'm not going to make it through those. And the way that I do that is for work and self-sacrifice for others. So I love this program. And it's just amazing how we were one drink away from him not being there. And, and that's what I've been told. I never know when my next drink, I will leave this program and I will never be able to come back. And I believe that. And so that's why for me, it's so important. And when I the crazy starts, I need to immediately do that 10th step. And the, the last part of that is to turn my thoughts to someone I can help. It's saved my life many a time. Thanks. Well, that is, that's absolutely the truth and a beautiful share, Dennis. I always enjoy listening to you share. And, and it's just, it just hammers home everything on those two pages there, 14 and 15, like you talked about. Look at how self-centeredness was gone. As you look to the second to the last paragraph, he says, while I lay in the hospital, the thought came, keyword, the thought came, that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. We don't just think like that anymore. Something has to happen to us in order for that to be that way. So we see here where he is really in the in the midst of the spiritual experience. He said, perhaps I could help some of them. <laughs> That's not the way most of us think. They, in turn, might work with others. That's the spiritual experience that changes our outlook, and that's exactly what it did to him there. But here's the reason that I, I ask everybody, and some of you guys know this, you know, from day one, if I take you through this process, you have to agree to do this exactly the way I did it with you. And it comes from the bottom of 14 here. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all of my affairs. That's first. Particularly, though, here it is. It was imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. And I think that's the key to this because without that, I'm not going to experience what Dennis was sharing so beautifully about their own 14 and 15 and I'm definitely not going to be able to stay spiritually connected in what we read right there in the second to the last paragraph on 14, because my outlook begins to shift backwards again. It becomes more about me than it does about you. And, and I may not be drinking at all, but I'm in trouble at that point. I am because I feel that disconnect, you know. So it, it's amazing. You know, the book is just full of all of these nuggets that, and, you know, and you can keep cross-referencing it back and forth and back and forth, and it just makes it come alive. So really good stuff. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this and, and to have been able to go through this with so many of you that are here tonight and so many that aren't. It's, it's been a great journey for sure. So thanks.